a few days before March 20, 1944, because of the abominable weather with heavy rains, we stop flying. We pilots say about this weather even the sparrows prefer to walk. You can as long as this weather lasts, the Soviets can continue their offensive and force the Dnieper without any hindrance. Against this threat, it is impossible to organize a defense. Not a single company can be allocated from the Nikolaev area. There are no other reserves. In any case, we assume that our Romanian allies, out of a sense of self-preservation, will defend their country with fanatical fury and by this can compensate for our numerical weakness. On March 20, after seven sorties to the areas of Nikolaev and Balta, I fly with my squadron for the eighth time, our first mission in the last five days against the Yampol Bridge. The sky is bright blue, and we can assume almost certainly that after such a long break the defences will be significantly strengthened by anti-aircraft and fighter protection. Since the airfield and the village of Rakovka itself are drowning in mud, our fighter squadron has relocated to Odessa, whose airfield has a concrete runway. Our Stukas, equipped with wide tyres, are able to cope much better with the mud and fall through it to a lesser extent than the fighters. We agree by phone to rendezvous at a certain time at 45 km from the target at an altitude of 5,000 metres, just above a conspicuous bend of the Dnister. But there are likely to be some difficulties in Odessa. There is no escort at the rendezvous point. The target is clearly marked, so we naturally decide to continue the flight. There are several new crews in my squadron. The quality of their training is not as high as it used to be. Really good pilots by then have long been at the front. Fuel for training flights is strictly rationed and is a certain number of litres per person. I firmly believe that if I myself had been limited to such a small quantity, I could not have flown better than these young pilots. We are still 30 kilometers from our target when I warn. Enemy fighters. More than 20 Soviet La Fives are approaching us. Our load of bombs makes maneuvering difficult. I fly defensive circles so that I can tail the fighters at any moment as they intend to shoot down my trailing plane. Despite the aerial combat, I am gradually getting closer to my target. I frustrate the individual Russians who try to shoot me down by coming in from the front with my mobile tactics. Then at the last moment, I dive through the thick of them and start climbing up. If the young crews can hold out for the rest of today, they can learn a lot. Prepare to attack. Close formation. Attack. And I dive for the bridge. As I dive, I see the flashes of the anti-aircraft guns protecting the bridge. The shells screech past my plane. Henschel says that the sky is like covered with wool, which is what he calls the bursts of anti-aircraft shells. Our formation is losing its monolithic strength and falling apart, making us more vulnerable to fighter attacks. I warn those waddling behind Eind. Hurry up and catch up. We're as scared as you are. Not a single swear word rolls off my tongue. I make a turn and from a height of 300 meters, I see my bomb explode near the bridge. So the wind is blowing. Wind left, correction left. A direct bomb hit from our third plane destroys the bridge. Circling around, I spot the anti-aircraft batteries and give the order to attack them. They're going to get it today. Henschel expresses his opinion. Unfortunately, the two new crews are a little behind during the dive. The lags cut them off. One of these planes is riddled with bullets and whizzes past me toward enemy territory. I try to catch up with him, but I can't leave the whole squadron to fend for itself because of him. I yell at him over the radio telephone. I berate him, but nothing helps. He leaves, descending, to the Russian bank of the Dnester. Behind him stretches a narrow strip of smoke. No doubt he could have stayed in the air for a few minutes longer, like the others, and would have reached our trenches. His nerves have given out. That idiot, fickle comments over the radio telephone. At this point I can no longer deal with the downed plane as I must try to hold together our battered formation and maneuver westward using defensive circles. Fifteen minutes later, the Red Fighters withdraw and we head towards our base in our normal formation. I order the 7th Squadron Commander to lead the formation home. Together with Lieutenant Fisher, 
who pilots the second staff plane, I turn around and go back at low altitude over the Nister. The river flows here between high steep banks. Ahead, in the direction of the bridge, I see Russian fighter planes patrolling at an altitude of one to three kilometers. But here, in the river valley, it is difficult to see me, and besides, no one is expecting my return. As soon as I rise above the shrubbery that covers the banks, on the right, three or four kilometers away, I notice our plane. It has made an emergency landing in a field. The crew stands beside the car and as I fly past them at low altitude begins to gesticulate furiously. If only you had paid attention to me earlier, this delicate operation could have been avoided. I mutter to myself and turn around to determine if this field is suitable for landing. Yes, it's safe to land. I give myself a pep talk. That's okay then. Carry on. This will be the seventh crew I pull out from under the noses of the Russians. I command Fisher to stay in the air and distract the fighters in case they attack. After bombing the bridge, I know where the wind is coming from. Release the flaps, take off the throttle, I'll land in a heartbeat. But what happens? I miss and have to throttle up again and come in again. This has never happened to me before. Or is this a bad omen? You're very close to the target you just attacked. Far behind the front lines. Cowardice. One more throttle down, flaps out, I land. And immediately I notice that the ground is very soft. I don't even have to brake. My plane stops exactly in front of my two colleagues. It's a rookie crew, a sergeant and a sergeant. Henschel raises the lantern and I show them signs to get in quickly. The engine roars. They climb into the cockpit with Henschel. Red falcons are circling overhead. They haven't spotted us yet. Henschel, ready? Yeah. I let off the gas, hit the left brake, intending to taxi so that I take off in the same direction I came from. But my right tire is stuck in the ground. The more gas I apply, the more my wheel sinks into the ground. My airplane refuses to move off, probably because there is a lot of dirt packed between the fairing and the wheel. Henschel, get out and remove the fairing. Maybe then we'll be able to take off. The mount has broken off. The fairing stays in place, but even without it, we wouldn't be able to take off. We are stuck in the mud. I pull the handle towards me, release it, and give reverse. Not the slightest hint that this will help. It might be possible to spar, but that doesn't help either. Fisher flies over and asks on the radio telephone, Should I land? After a second's thought, I tell myself that if he lands, he won't be able to take off either and reply. No, don't land. You have to fly home. I look around. There are willows running toward us in a crowd. They're already 300 meters away. Get out of the cockpit. Follow me, I shout, and there we are, hurtling south as fast as we can. As we landed, I saw that we were about five kilometers from the Dniester. We would have to cross the river no matter what, or we would be easy prey for the Reds pursuing us. Running is not so easy. I'm wearing high fur ounce and a fur-lined jacket. It's best to ignore the sweat. No one needs to be pushed. We are not going to end up in a Soviet prisoner of war camp. For dive bomber pilots, it is tantamount to certain death. We've been running like this for half an hour. Who should have seen it from the outside? The Ivans are a good kilometer behind us. Suddenly we find ourselves on the edge of an almost sheer cliff, which is washed by the waters of the river. We run here and there, looking for a path to get down. But it's impossible. The Ivans are already on our heels. Then suddenly a childhood memory comes to my mind. When I was a boy, we used to climb down from the top of a tree, sliding down the branches and reaching the ground in one piece. Large thorny bushes grow in abundance on the rocky slope. One by one, we slide down and land at the water's edge. Our hands and feet are scratched and our clothes have turned to rags. Henschel is terrified. He shouts. Let's dive. Better to drown than be captured by the Russians. I'm using common sense. We're panting from running. A brief respite and then we tear off our outer clothing. Breathing heavily, the Ivans meanwhile run up to the cliff. We are not easily seen. They run back and forth and can't figure out where we've gone. I'm sure they think we couldn't have jumped off the cliff. The Dionister is rushing, the snow is melting, and there is a lot of ice floating by. 
The width of the river here by eye is about half a kilometer, and the temperature is three or four degrees above freezing. The others are already in the water. I get rid of my umbrellas and fur jacket. I follow them, wearing only my shirt and pants, my map under my shirt, my medals and compass in my pants pocket. When I touch the water, I say to myself, no way in hell. Then I think of an alternative, and there I am floating. Moments pass, and I am paralyzed by the cold. I gulp for air with my mouth. I no longer feel like I'm floating. Concentrate. Think about swimming and keep the rhythm. The distant shore approaches almost imperceptibly. The others are swimming ahead. I think of Henschel. He passed his swim test with me when we were in the reserve unit in Graz. But if he puts his all into these more difficult conditions today, he could repeat the record time or perhaps come very close to it. In the middle of the river, I find myself next to him, a few meters behind the gunner from the other plane. The sergeant is swimming far ahead. He seems to be an excellent swimmer. Gradually, we become immune to sensation. We are saved by the instinct of self-preservation, bend or break. I am surprised at the endurance of the others, since as a former athlete I am used to overexertion. My mind dives into memories. When I did the decathlon, I always ended up running a kilometre and a half after I strived to show everything I was capable of in the other nine exercises. This time the hard workouts repay me a hundred. The sergeant climbs out of the water and falls ashore. A little later, the corporal and I reach the shore. Henschel has another 150 metres to swim. The other two lie motionless, frozen to the bone, the gunner mumbling something as if in a delirium. Poor fellow! I sit on the shore and see Henschel trying to reach the shore. Another 80 metres. Suddenly he throws his hands up and shouts. I can't, I can't go on and plunges into the water. He immediately resurfaces, but then sinks again and doesn't show his face again. I jump into the water again, using up the last 10% of energy I hoped I had managed to conserve. I reach the spot where Henschel dived into the water. I can't dive because I have to take a deep breath to do so, but I can't get enough air because of the cold. After several failed attempts, I can barely make it to shore. If I had somehow grabbed hold of Henschel, I would probably have ended up at the bottom of the Dinister with him. He was very heavy and such a strain would have been beyond anyone's strength. Here I lay on the shore with my arms spread, weak, exhausted. And somewhere inside is a deep sorrow for my friend Henschel. We say a prayer for the repose of our comrade's soul. The map is soaked through, but I keep it all in my head. The devil knows how far behind the Russian lines we are, or is there still a chance we'll run into the Romanians sooner or later? I'm checking our weapons. I have a 6.35 caliber revolver with six rounds. The sergeant has a 7.65 with a full magazine. The sergeant lost his revolver in the water and only has a broken Henschel knife. We march south, clutching our weapons in our hands. The faintly hilly terrain is familiar from flying. There are several villages in the vicinity, and a railroad runs 35 km south from west to east. I know only two stations on it, the Belta and Floristi. Even if the Russians have penetrated this far, we can count on the fact that this railroad line is still free of the enemy. The time is about three o'clock in the afternoon. The sun stands high. The first thing we do is enter a small valley surrounded by hills. We are stiff with cold, the corpora is still delirious. I resort to prudence. We must try to avoid any populated areas. Each of us gets a certain sector to watch. I'm starving. It suddenly dawns on me that I haven't eaten anything all day. We were making our eighth sortie, and there was no time to eat between missions. After returning from each mission, a report must be written and sent to the team, and instructions for the next operation are already coming over the phone. Meanwhile, our planes are refueled. The gunners load ammunition, hang bombs, and we take off again. The crews may get some rest and even ingest something, but I don't have to count on it. I guess we've been going for over an hour now. The sun is starting to set and our clothes are starting to gradually freeze. There's something up ahead, or am I wrong? No, there really is something up ahead. There are three figures moving in our direction against the background of sunshine, which makes it hard to see details. 
They're already 300 meters away from us. These people, of course, have already spotted us. They may have taken up a position at the top of one of the hills. Tall guys, Romanians, no doubt. I can get a better look at them now. Those on the right and left carry rifles over their shoulders. The one in the middle is armed with a rifle with a round disc. It's a young guy, the other two are in their forties, must be reservists. They are dressed in brown and green uniforms. Without making any hostile gestures, they come closer to us. I suddenly realize that we are now not wearing any uniforms, and therefore they cannot make out who we are. I hastily advise the corporal to put his revolver away and hide mine myself, just in case the Romanians get nervous and start shooting. The trio stops a meter in front of us and looks at us curiously. I begin to explain to our allies that we are Germans, made a forced landing, and ask them to help us with clothes and food, adding that we would like to return to our unit as soon as possible. I repeat, we are German pilots, made a forced landing, but their faces turn grim and at the same moment I see three muzzles pointed at my chest. The young fellow instantly grasps my holster and pulls a revolver from there. They were standing with their backs to the sun. Now I could get a better look at them. The hammer and sickle means Russian. I'm not going to surrender for a second, I'm thinking only of escape. I have one chance in a hundred. There must be a good bounty on my head in Russia, and if I'm captured alive, the reward must be even greater. Blowing my brains out wouldn't be practical for them. I'm disarmed. I slowly turn my head to see which way the shore is. Stop. I turn around, duck low, and run headlong, darting from side to side. Three shots ring out, followed by a long burst from a machine gun, a searing pain in my shoulder. The young guy hit my shoulder with the machine gun. The other two missed. I run like a hare, zigzagging up the hill, bullets whistling around me. The Ivans run after me, stop, fire, fire, run, fire, 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 run. Only a moment ago I thought I could only drag my feet, so stiff they stiffened from the cold. But now I'm running like I've never run in my life. Blood trickles down my shoulder, and I make an effort to dispel the darkness in front of my eyes. I've already gained fifty meters on my pursuers, bullets whistling incessantly. My only thought is, only he who resigns himself to defeat perishes. The hill seems endless. I run toward the sun to make it harder for the Ivans to aim. My figure almost dissolves in the sunshine and it's harder for them to hit me. I've just learned that lesson myself. Here I reach the ridge, but my strength is running out and hoping to stretch it some more, I decide to stick to the top of the ridge. I won't be able to endure another descent and descent, so I run sideways along the ridge. From the neighboring hill there are about twenty more Ivans running towards me. Most likely they have seen everything and are about to round up their exhausted and wounded prey. My faith in God is shaken. Why did he initially allow me to believe in the possible success of my escape? I have just escaped from a completely hopeless situation. And would he hand me over to my enemies unarmed, stripped of my last weapon? My physical strength, my determination to flee suddenly receives a new impetus. I run swiftly down the hill. Behind me, two hundred or three hundred meters away, are my original pursuers, a new group coming up from the side. Only two are left of the first trio, for a moment they cannot see me because I am on the far side of the hill. One of them stays behind to bring my two companions, who had stayed put at the moment of my escape. The hounds on my left keep a parallel course. They want to cut me off. Here begins a ploughed field. I stumble back and glance for a moment at the Ivans. I am deadly tired. I stumble over a clod of earth and lie where I fell. The end is not long in coming. I mutter another curse. I have no revolver, and so I don't even have the opportunity to deprive the Ivans of their triumph to take me prisoner. My eyes turn toward the Reds. They are already running across the same ploughed field and must watch their feet carefully. They run another fifteen meters, then look back and look to the right to where I lie. Here they are level with me. Here they go on, running forward another two hundred and fifty meters, turning in a line. They stop and look around, unable to see where I've gone. I am lying on the slightly frozen ground and trying to burrow into the ground. The ground is very hard. The little clods of earth I manage to scrape up, I throw forward. 
gradually digging myself a foxhole. My wounds are bleeding. There is nothing to dress them with. I am lying flat on the icy ground in my wet clothes. My insides are on fire at the thought that at any moment I could be captured. Once again, the odds are 100 to 1 that I'll be discovered and captured in less than a minute. But is that a reason to give up in an almost hopeless situation, when only the belief that the almost impossible can become possible can help? The Russians are now coming in my direction, shortening the distance between us, each of them searching a different section of the field, but not methodically. Some of them are looking in completely the wrong direction. They don't bother me. But here's one coming straight toward me. There's a terrible tension. Before he reaches me twenty paces away, he stops. Is he looking at me? Yes or no? No doubt he's looking in my direction. Does he come closer? What is he waiting for? For a few minutes he hesitates for what seems to me like an eternity. Every now and then he turns his head to the right or left. In fact he is looking somewhere far away in the field. I momentarily gain confidence, but then I see danger ripening right in front of me again and my hopes are dashed. Meanwhile the silhouettes of my first pursuers appear on the ridge, and now that so many hounds are on the trail, they no longer take their task seriously. Suddenly, behind my back and slightly to the side, I hear the rumble of airplanes and look over my shoulder. Stukas from my squadron together with a strong fighter escort and two storches are flying over the Dinista. That means that Lieutenant Fisher has already sounded the alarm, and they are looking for me to get me out of this mess. Up there, they don't even suspect that they are looking in the wrong direction, and after landing, I've already travelled a dozen kilometres and ended up on this side of the river. At this distance there is no way I can attract their attention. I don't even dare to lift my little finger up. They make one circle after another at different altitudes. Then they move off to the east and disappear, and many of them will be thinking, this time even he couldn't make it. They fly home. I watch them eagerly. You at least know you'll sleep in shelter tonight and stay alive and I don't even know. So many minutes of life do I have left. The sun is slowly setting. Why am I still undetected? A column of Ivans is moving down the hillside, in marching Indian formation like Indians, with horses and dogs. Once again I doubt God's justice, for it will not be long before darkness protects me. I feel the ground shake with their footsteps. My nerves are strained to the limit. I furtively glance back. People and animals are walking a hundred meters away from me. Why didn't the dogs smell me? Why can't anyone detect me? As they pass me, they scatter in a chain at intervals of two meters. If they had done it fifty meters earlier, they would have walked right down my back. They disappear into the slowly thickening twilight. The evening sky turns dark blue, with faintly twinkling stars. My compass doesn't glow in the darkness, but there is still enough light for me to discern its readings. I must keep heading south. On this side of the sky, I see a prominent and easily distinguishable star, and another smaller one nearby. I decide to make them my landmarks. I wonder what constellation it is. It gets completely dark, and I can't see anyone else. I get up, stiff and hungry, my whole body aching and thirsty. I remember my chocolate, but I left it in my fur jacket on the bank of the Dinister, avoiding roads, paths and villages because Ivan must have posted sentries everywhere. I walk straight ahead, guided by the stars up the hill and down into the valley, wading through streams, crossing marshy lowlands and fields where the corn was removed in the fall. My bare feet are cut to shreds. Again and again I bruise myself on large rocks. Gradually my feet stop feeling anything. The will to life and freedom make me hold on. They are inseparable. Life without freedom is only a shell. How far has Ivan penetrated our positions? How long do I have to travel? If I hear a dog barking, I avoid the place, as the surrounding farms are most likely occupied by enemies. On the horizon I often see gun flashes and a deafening rumble. Apparently ours have started shelling. But this means that the Russian breakthrough is over. At the bottom of the ravines that here and there cut through the hills I often stumble in the dark and fall into the ditches where there is knee-deep sticky mud. It sucks me in and I no longer have the strength to free myself. 
I grab the edge of the ditch with my hands and pull my torso out of the water, but my feet are still in the sludge. And so I lie there, exhausted, feeling as if my batteries have run out. After lying like this for five minutes, I gradually recharge and accumulate enough strength to climb up the steep walls of the ditch. But this unpleasantness is repeated without any pity again and again, at least where the ground is uneven. And so it goes on until 9 p.m. Well, that's it. I've had enough. Even after a long rest, I can't regain my strength. Without water, food and sleep, I can't continue. I decide to look for some detached house. I hear a dog barking in the distance and walk towards the sound. I am probably quite close to the village. A little while later I come across a lonely farmhouse and struggle to quiet the barking dog. I don't like this barking at all. I am afraid it will attract the attention of some picket in the neighbouring village. I knock on the door but no one opens, probably no one is there. The same thing happens again at the second farm. I go to the third. When no one answers this time either, I lose patience and open the window to climb inside. At that moment a door is opened by a fearful man with a smoking oil lamp. I'm already halfway through the window, but now I climb out again and put my foot in the door. The old woman tries to shove me away. I walk past her resolutely. Turning in a circle, I point in the direction of the village and ask, Bolshevisti, she nods affirmatively. From this I deduce that Ivan has occupied the village. The dim light of a lamp faintly illuminates the room, a table, a bench, an ancient sideboard. In the corner, a grey-bearded old man snores on a rather crooked bed. He must be in his seventies. In silence I cross the room and lie down next to him on the wooden couch. What can I say? I don't know Russian. The woman will realise now that I'm not going to do them any harm. I'm barefoot the rags of my shirt sticky with clotted blood. I look more like stalked game than a nocturnal burglar. I lie down. A lamp flickers dimly above our heads. It doesn't occur to me to ask them to bandage my shoulder or my cut legs. I only want to rest. I am hungry and thirsty again. I sit on the bed and fold my palms in a pleading gesture, at the same time gesturing that I am thirsty and hungry. After hesitating for a moment, she brings me a pitcher of water and a piece of mouldy cornbread. Never in my life have I eaten anything tastier. With each sip and piece of bread I feel a rush of strength, as if the will to live and act has returned to me. At first I eat greedily, but after eating a little, I begin to reflect on my situation and develop a plan of action for the next few hours. I drink and eat. I rest until one o'clock in the morning. It is now half past ten in the evening. Need to get some rest. So I lie down again on the wooden planks with the old men half asleep, half awake. I wake up every fifteen minutes like clockwork and check the time. Whatever happens, I can't waste the saving darkness on sleep. I have to make my way as far south as possible. Natch mo five ten o'clock. Tin and so on. Twelve d five neo time to pack. I sneak outside. The old woman closes the door behind me. I stumble and fall down the steps. Is it my sleep or is it the dark night's fault? Or maybe the steps are slippery? It's raining. I can't see anything at arm's length. The stars are gone. Which way do I go? Then I remember that when I walked the night before, the wind was blowing at my back. If I want to make my way south, I need to move with the wind. Or has it changed? I am still among the buildings on the farm. Here I am protected from the wind. The wind blows one way and then the other. I'm afraid I'll be moving in circles. Inky darkness, obstacles. I bump into something and bruise my shin. The dogs bark with glee. The houses are still around somewhere. It's the countryside. I can only pray that the next minute I don't run into a Russian sentry. Finally, I find myself in the open and put my back to the wind with confidence. I am also rid of the mongrels. I ramble as before, up the hill, down the slope, up, down cornfields, rocks, overgrowths, in which it is most difficult to keep my direction, for among the trees the wind is almost subsiding. On the horizon I see the incessant flashes of the guns and hear their measured booms. They help me to keep my course. Shortly after 3 a.m. I see a vague glimmer of light on my left. Dawn is near.
a good check. Now I am sure that the wind has not changed direction, and I am heading in the right direction. I've already covered 10 kilometers. I think I covered 15, 18 kilometers yesterday, so now I am 25 kilometers from the Dinista. The hill at about 200 meters high rises in front of me. I climb it. Perhaps from the top I will see something and be able to identify some landmarks. It's already light, but I can't spot any special places. To my left and right a few kilometers away I see three tiny villages. But I discover that my hill is actually the start of a ridge that runs north-south, so I was able to maintain my direction of travel. The slopes of the ridge are smooth and bare, so it would be easy to see if someone was walking towards me. From here it would be easy to spot any movement. The pursuers would have to scramble upward, and that would put them at a disadvantage. So who at this moment suspects my presence? I am happy because although it is already daylight, I am confident that I can walk south a few more kilometers. I would like to cover as much distance as possible today without delay. I estimate the length of the ridge to be about 10 kilometers, which is a lot. But is it really that much? Among other things, I encourage myself, you've run 10 kilometers. How often? In 40 minutes. What you could do then in 40 minutes, you can do now in an hour. And the prize is your freedom. So imagine you're running a marathon. I must have been a suitable model for the mad artist when I did that marathon run along the top of the ridge. Waddling, ragged, barefoot, on bleeding feet, clutching my hand to my chest so that my wounded shoulder wouldn't hurt so much. You have to do it. Think about running and running and keep running. Every now and then I switch to a trot and then after another hundred meters to a step. Then I start running again. I could make it in an hour, but now unfortunately I must descend from the heights that protected me. The road leads me down. In front of me stretches a wide plain. A small gully goes in the same direction as the ridge. This is dangerous because here I am more easily caught off guard. Besides, the time is already approaching seven o'clock in the morning, and unpleasant encounters are more likely. Once again, my batteries are depleted. I must drink, eat, rest. I still haven't seen a single person. Should I take precautions? But what can I do? I am unarmed. I am hungry and thirsty. Prudence is certainly a virtue, but thirst and hunger are strong. Need makes me careless. To the left ahead, two farms are visible on the horizon out of the morning haze. I must sneak inside. For a moment I stop at the barn door and peek around the corner. Inside is empty, there is nothing. No harness, no farm implements, no living thing, but no. A rat runs from one corner to the other. There is a large pile of corn rotting in the current. I search it greedily. If only I could find a cob or two, or even a few kernels but I find nothing. I search again and again. Suddenly I hear something crunching behind me. Several figures quietly creep past the entrance to another shack. Who are they, Russians or refugees, hungry like me and hoping to reach their own? Or are they robbers on the prowl for prey? I search the other farm. I scrutinize all the piles, nothing. Frustrated, I decide that if there is no food, I can at least use these piles to rest. I make myself a shelter in a pile of corn leaves and I'm just getting ready to lay down when I hear a new noise. A cart rumbling down the road, a man in a high fur hat sitting on it, a girl behind him. If there is a girl, then there is no danger, so I approach them. Judging by the black fur hat, this is a Romanian peasant. I ask the girl, do you have any food? If you eat this... She pulls a few stale flatbreads out of the sack. The peasant stops the horse. Only then does it realize that I asked a question in German and received an answer also in German. How do you know German? The girl tells me that she made her way with the German soldiers from Dnipropetrovsk and learned the language. Now she wants to stay with the Romanian peasant sitting next to her. They are fleeing from the Russians. But you're going straight in their direction. I can see in their faces that they don't believe me. Are the Russians already in that town? No, it's Floresti. This unexpected answer is reassuring. 
The town must be on the Bolta Floresti Railroad, which I know. Could you tell me if there are any German soldiers nearby? No, the Germans are gone, but there may be Romanian soldiers here. Thank you and Godspeed. I wave my hand as the wagon moves off. I'll probably be asked later why I didn't requisition the wagon. The idea never occurred to me. Aren't these two just as much refugees as I am? And shouldn't I be thanking God that I've been able to escape danger so far? After my excitement subsided, for a moment I was overcome with incredible weakness. All the last ten kilometers I had been in terrible pain. Suddenly it returned to my injured legs, my shoulder breaking with every step. I meet a crowd of refugees with wheelbarrows carrying the few belongings they had managed to save. They are rushing in a terrible panic. In the suburb of Floresti, two soldiers stand on the edge of a sand pit. German uniforms? A few more meters and my hopes are confirmed. An unforgettable sight? I call out to them, come here. They shout to me from above, what does that mean? Come here, who are you, buddy? I'm Major Rudel. Yeah, no major looks like that. I don't have any papers with me, but in my pocket is the knight's cross with oak leaves and swords. I take it out of my pocket and show it to them. After looking at it, the corporal says, Well then, is there a German commandant's office here? No, only the headquarters of the field hospital. That's where I have to go. They flank me and lead me. I hobble rather than walk. The doctor cuts my shirt and pants with scissors, rags stuck to my body. He smears iodine on the wounds on my legs and bandages my shoulder. During this procedure, I greedily choke on the most delicious sausage of my life. I ask him to let them take me to the airfield in Balta. Here I hope to find an airplane that will take me to the squadron. What kind of clothes should I give you? The doctor asks me. All my clothes are cut to shreds. We have nothing. They wrap me naked in a blanket and take me by car to Balta. But what is it? The car door is opened by the engineer of the 3rd Squadron, Lieutenant E. Bursby. Lieutenant Eberspark, commander of the advanced group of the 3rd Squadron, we are flying to Ayasil. He is accompanied by a soldier who carries clothes for me. It turns out that my travelling naked from Floresti had already been reported to Balta by telephone and Eberspark was in the control room when the report came in. He was informed that his colleague, who had gone missing, would be arriving shortly in, in a newborn suit. I climb into a U-52 and fly to Rakovka, where my squadron is stationed. The phone rings, the news spreads everywhere like wildfire and regimental cook. Runkel has already started baking a birthday cake. The squadron is built, I look into the smiling faces. I feel reborn, as if a miracle has happened. Life is coming back to me and this reunion with my comrades in arms is the best reward for the hardest distance of my life. Et a d. We mourn the loss of Henschel, our best gunner who flew 1200 combat missions. This evening we're all sitting around the campfire together, there's a festive atmosphere. The group has sent delegates, among them a doctor who is supposed to sit at the headboard of my bed. He sends me the general's congratulations, together with orders that I am not to fly and will be immediately sent on leave, as soon as I am sufficiently recovered. Again, I have to disappoint our poor general, for I am more concerned with the question whether we can now hold the Soviets who, having forced the Dionista, are tearing southward in large forces. I cannot spend a single day in bed. Next morning we have to move to Eliasi. It's bad weather, we can't fly. If there are no flights, I can obey the doctor's orders and rest. The next day I fly with my squadron to Ayasi, from where it is closer to make combat sorties across the Dinister. My shoulder is bandaged and I can't move my arm, but it doesn't interfere too much with flying. Worse, my legs are shredded to the bone and I can't walk. Any pressure on the pedals causes unbearable pain. I am carried to the airplane in my arms. Assi is a pretty Romanian town, so far completely intact. It's a great view for us, it reminds us of home. We gawk in the store windows and rejoice like children. The next morning our reconnaissance detects strong enemy armoured and motorised forces north of Balta. They are probably already entering the city. 
At first the weather is bad, the terrain is mountainous, and the highest peaks are shrouded in fog. There are no more troops to hold the front. The enemy's motorized infantry could be here in a few hours. Who will stop them? We're alone. Reconnaissance reports heavy fire from anti-aircraft guns, which the advancing Reds have brought with them. Soviet La Fives and Aero Cobras are constantly circling over these armored wedges. Our entire southern front in Russia and the crucial oil fields in Romania have been jeopardized. I am deaf and blind to all advice based on my physical condition. The Soviets must be stopped and their tanks. The striking force of the army must be destroyed. It will be weeks before our counterparts on the ground can establish a line of defense. My gunner, non-commissioned officer Rothman, carries me in his arms to the plane. Six sorties to exhaustion in the morning, then three in the afternoon. The weather is terrible. Heavy anti-aircraft fire. After almost every sortie, I have to change my airplane because of the damage done by anti-aircraft guns. I feel very ill. Only the determination to stop the Soviets wherever I would meet them keeps me strong. Besides, it was these soldiers who tried to take me prisoner and on the day I escaped. The Moscow radio had already reported that they had captured Major Rudel himself. Most likely they did not believe that I was able to reach my colleagues. Did my colleagues who couldn't escape with me give up my name? Using bombs and cannons we attacked tanks, columns of trucks with gasoline and food, infantry and cavalry. We strike from an altitude of 10 to 200 meters because the weather is nasty. Together with other planes equipped with 37 guns, I go on a tank hunt at extremely low altitude. Soon the other crews are left on the ground because when my plane is damaged, I have to use another one, and so on until there are no serviceable anti-tank vehicles left at all. If it takes too long to refuel an entire squadron, I order fuel to be quickly poured into my plane and together with another pilot, we make extra flights between general sorties. Usually our fighters are not in the air. The Russians are using all their numerical advantage against us alone. During these air battles I find it difficult to maneuver because I can't push the pedals. I only use one control stick. But so far I have only taken damage from anti-aircraft fire, albeit during every sortie which is quite often. During the last combat sortie that day, I fly an ordinary Stuka with bombs and two guns of two-inch caliber. With these weapons, it is impossible to penetrate even medium-thick tank armor. Presumably, the Reds do not expect us to show up so late. Our only purpose is to establish their places of concentration and to get a general idea of the situation, which is essential for tomorrow. We fly along the two roads that run north toward Balta. The sun is already setting. Huge clouds of smoke are rising over the village of Falesti on the left ahead. Perhaps there are still Romanian troops there. I fall behind the squadron and fly over the village. I am met by heavy anti-aircraft fire. I see a mass of tanks, followed by a large column of trucks and motorized infantry. Curiously, the tanks have two or three spare fuel tanks. It's as if a flash illuminates my... They are no longer expecting our appearance and want to break through tonight into the heart of Romania, in the oil fields and thus cut off our entire southern front. They take advantage of dusk and darkness, because during the day they can't move when my stukas are circling over their heads. That's why the tanks are equipped with extra tanks. It means they can break through even without their trucks. This is a major operation and they've already started it. I can see it quite clearly now. We're the only ones who know what's going on, so the responsibility is ours. I'm giving the order on the radio to... This attack is of the utmost importance. Bombs to be dropped one at a time. Attack at low altitude until ammunition runs out. The gunners will also fire on the vehicles. I drop the bombs and start hunting the tanks with my 20 min guns. At other times it would be a pure waste of effort to fire on tanks with weapons of this caliber, but today the Ivans are carrying tanks of fuel, and that's where they miscalculated. After the first bombs, the Russian column stops, and then, under cover of ferocious anti-aircraft fire, tries to move on, maintaining formation. But we don't let ourselves be intimidated. Only now they realize that we are serious. 
They panic and scatter away from the road, turn into the fields and circle incessantly, performing every defensive maneuver they know. Every time I fire, I hit the tank with a burst or incendiary shell. Apparently the fuel leaks through the gaps. Some of the tanks that stand in the shadow of the hill explode with blinding flashes. If their ammunition explodes, the sky is redrawn with a veritable fireworks display. And if the tank is carrying a certain number of flares, they shower everything around them with an unimaginable array of colors. Every time I go into attack, I am conscious of the responsibility that lies upon us and hope that we will succeed. It's lucky we spotted this column today. I'm running out of ammunition. I've already destroyed five tanks, but there are still several monsters in the field, some of them still moving. I still have to pay them back somehow. Hanolor 7 is the call sign of the commander of the 7th unit. Come home after you've used up all your ammunition. I'm flying at top speed to the airfield with my wingman. We are not waiting for refueling. We have enough fuel for a new flight. We only need ammunition. Twilight is fast approaching. Everything is going too slowly, although our gunners are working hard. I have already explained to them what is at stake, and now they are doing their best not to let down their comrades in the air. Ten minutes later I take off again. On the way we meet the returning squadron, it is already approaching the airfield with the landing lights on. An eternity seems to pass before I find myself over the target. Even from afar I can see burning tanks and trucks. The explosions illuminate the battlefield with an ominous light. Visibility is very poor. I head north and flying at a low altitude over the road I come upon two steel monsters that are heading in the same direction, probably with the intention of bringing the sad news to the rear. I make a turn, go in for the attack. I can only distinguish them at the very last second when I'm flying low. It's not easy to hit them. But they, like their predecessors, have spare fuel tanks, and I manage to blow them both up, even though I have to use up all my ammunition. Together with these two, a total of 17 tanks are destroyed during the day. My squadron destroyed about the same number, so the Ivans have lost at least 30 tanks today. This is a black day for them. Today, after all the events, nothing would disturb our sleep in Iasi. Of that we can be sure. We will find out tomorrow how far the offensive has advanced. We sit down in complete darkness. Gradually, as the tension subsides, I begin to feel pain. Both the army and the group command want to know all the details. Half the night I hold the telephone receiver next to my ear. X is at A. Today's mission is quite predictable. To attack the same enemy forces as yesterday. We're taking off very early, so that we can be over the target as soon as dawn breaks, as we can be sure that Ivan has made good use of the respite. The weather is still inclement and the height of the lower cloud edge is 120 meters. Once again, St. Peter helps the enemy. Surrounding hills are poorly recognizable. We can only fly along the valleys. I wonder what's in store for us today. We're flying past Felesti. There's just debris, everything, just like we left yesterday. South of Belter, we meet the first tank and motorized infantry columns. We are greeted by anti-aircraft guns and fighter planes. Everyone must know by now what a performance we gave here yesterday. I should be especially careful today and under no circumstances make a forced landing anywhere near here. We attack without delay. During every sortie we engage in air battles without any escort, as there are hardly any of our fighters in this sector. Besides, we have trouble with the weather. We have to fly very low all the time, and we can't do without losses. But we have to ignore it because we are dealing with an emergency situation and it is in our own interest not to stop attacking for a minute. If we don't get in the air, not much time will pass and the Ivan will take over our airfield. It is a pity that during these difficult sorties Henschel is not with me. With his experience as a gunner he could make my life much easier. My gunner today is non-commissioned officer Rothman. He's a good guy, but he lacks experience. We all love flying with him because we say, even if no one comes back, you can bet Rothman will make it out somehow. After our return from the first mission, I lament the delay and go on an intermediate flight accompanied by Fisher. We attack tanks on the outskirts of Bolter. 
Above the target we have to rendezvous with several fighters. We fly as low as possible. The weather has become even worse. Visibility does not exceed 800 meters. As we fly higher above the city, I look for fighters. And there they are indeed, but not ours, but the Russians. Look, Fisher, it's only Aracobras. Keep up. Come closer. They've already spotted us. About twenty of them. Only two of us easy prey. They're attacking us with confidence. We can't gain altitude. We have to fly over the ground using every ravine to get lost. I am unable to maneuver because I can't push the pedals. I can only change course slightly by working one control stick. This tactic doesn't save me for long, especially if I'm being followed by a fighter whose pilot knows at least the basics of his craft. But the one following me now knows his craft perfectly. Rothman is starting to get nervous. They're gonna shoot us down. I yell for him to shut up and shoot, instead of wasting his breath. He keeps yelling. Shells are going into the fuselage. Rath a tat tat tat. Hit after hit. I can't use the pedals. I'm overcome with blind rage. I'm out of my mind with rage. I hear the rumble of large caliber shells. In addition to the 20 Mim cannons, the Aracobra is firing 30 M shells at me. How long will my trusty U87 hold out? How long will it be before the airplane is engulfed in flames or it falls to pieces? I was shot down 30 times during the war, but always by anti-aircraft and never by fighters. Each time I used the pedals and maneuvered with them. That's the first and last time a fighter hit my plane. Rothman fire, he doesn't answer. His last words. Shit, the machine gun's jammed. Now I have no defense behind me. The Ivans are not slow to take advantage of this. They become even more aggressive than before and come at me from behind right left. One buddy attacks me from the front time after time. I take cover in the narrowest ravine I can squeeze into with great difficulty, barely missing the walls with my wings. They're firing pretty well, taking hit after hit. The chances of getting home are slim, but not far from our airfield in Iasi they give up the pursuit, probably out of ammunition. I lost Fisher. He was flying sideways and behind all the time and I lost sight of him. Rothman doesn't know what happened to him either. Did he go in for a forced landing or did he crash? I don't know. The loss of this capable young officer hits the squadron with particular force. My plane is riddled with 20 shells and hit by 8 shells from a 37-man gun. Rothman couldn't protect me for too long. Anyone would be knocked out after such an adventure, but there's nothing to be done about it. I climb into another airplane and fly again. The tips have to stop. On this day, I take out nine tanks. A difficult day. During the last sorties, I have to strain my eyesight to find at least one tank. That's a good sign. I assume that at this point the enemy offensive is exhausted, and infantry without armor will not be able to break through too far. The next morning reconnaissance confirms my assumptions. Everything is quiet, almost extinct. After I land after the first sortie of the day, a young mechanic jumps on the wing of my plane, gesticulating fervently, and congratulates me on my award of diamonds to the Knight's Cross. A phone call has just been received from the Fuhrer's headquarters, but the message also contains a ban on flying. The guy's individual words are drowned in the hum of the engines running, but I understand the meaning of what he's telling me. In order not to see the text of the message, I do not go to the control room, but stay by my airplane until preparations for the next flight are completed. At noon, the general calls me to Odessa by telephone. Meanwhile, congratulatory telegrams are coming in from everywhere, even from members of the government. There is an uphill struggle ahead to get permission to fly. The thought of my comrades preparing for a new flight and me having to follow to Odessa upsets me. I feel like some kind of leaper. This addition to the award makes me despondent and nullifies all the pleasure of knowing that my achievements have been so highly recognized. In Odessa, I learn nothing new. Only what I already know and what I would like to hear about. I absent-mindedly listen to the congratulations. My thoughts with my combat comrades who can care about nothing and keep flying. I envy them. I must proceed immediately to the Fuhrer's headquarters to be personally awarded the diamonds.
After a stopover in Tiraspol, we transfer to a U87. If only Henschel were with me, now Rothman is sitting behind me. We fly the route, Fokshini Bukharist Belgrade Kekski met Vienna Salzburg. It's not often that a head of state receives an office of reporting in his undies, but I'm glad I can walk around in them, even in constant pain. Oberst von Belov comes to Salzburg to accompany me, while Rothman goes to his home by train. We agree that I will pick him up in Silesia on the way back. For two days I sunbathe on the terrace of the hotel in Berchtesgaden, breathing in the delightful mountain air. Gradually I relax. Two days later I find myself in the company of the Führer in the magnificent Berghof. He knows my whole story down to the smallest detail and expresses his joy that fate has been so favourable to me and we have been able to achieve so much. I am impressed by his warmth and caring heart. He says that I have done enough so he orders me to stay on the ground. He explains that there is no need for all the great soldiers to give their lives. Their example and their experience should be preserved for new generations. I reply by refusing to accept the award. If, having received it, I will no longer be able to lead my squadron into battle. He frowns, a brief pause follows, then a smile appears on his face. Very well, in that case you can fly. I am happy at last and anticipate seeing the look of pleasure on the faces of my comrades when they hear I have returned. We drink tea together and talk for an hour or two. We discuss new weapons, the strategic situation, history. He explains to me specifically that there have been recent tests of the Feiyu weapons. At present, he says, it would be a mistake to overestimate its effectiveness, because the accuracy of the new weapon is still very low. But, he adds, this is not so important because there is hope of producing missiles that will be absolutely reliable. Later we will be able to rely not on ordinary explosives, but on something else so powerful that when we use it, the war will end immediately. He tells me that his development is already very far advanced and completion can be expected very soon. This is a completely new twist for me and I can't imagine it. Later I learn that the explosive effect of these new missiles will be based on atomic energy. After every visit to the Führer I get a lasting impression. From Salzburg I fly to Gorlitz, my hometown. The reception given in my honour tires me more than some combat sort is. When I finally get to my bed at seven o'clock in the morning, a chorus of girls singing serenades to me, my wife has to convince me for a long time to come out and wish them good morning. It is very difficult to explain to people that despite being awarded diamonds, I would not like to participate in celebrations and receptions. I only want to rest. I spend a few days with my parents in a close family circle. I listen to the news from the east on the radio and think about the soldiers fighting there. Finally nothing holds me any more and I can go back. I call Rothman in Zittau and our U87 carries us south again through Vienna and Bucharest to the eastern front. A few hours later I land at Foxani in northern Romania. My squadron is now stationed at Husi, a little farther north. The front is holding much more firmly than it did two weeks ago. It runs from the Prut to the Dinister along the edge of the plateau north of Iasi. It's the small town of Husi nestles between the hills. Some of them have extensive vineyards. Will we be able to wait for the wine? The airfield is on the northern edge of the town, and since our houses are on the opposite side, we have to walk through its streets every morning. The population watches our actions with interest. When you talk to them, they always show their friendliness. The representatives of the church are in particularly close contact with us. They are led by a bishop whom I often visit. He never ceases to explain to me that the clergy see in our victory the only chance to preserve religious freedom and independence. There are many merchants in the city. There are a huge number of small shops. It is all very different from the Soviet Russia we left so recently. Its middle class has disappeared, swallowed up by the proletarian Moloch. As I walk through the city, I am particularly struck by the sheer number of dogs. By all accounts, they are homeless. They wander everywhere. You meet them on every corner and in every square. I am temporarily housed in a small villa with a vineyard, with a small stream running along the side where you can swim. At night, whole processions of dogs pass through this vineyard. 
They move in Indian formation in packs of twenty or thirty. One morning I am still lying in bed when a huge mongrel dog peeps in at my window and puts its front paws on the sill. Behind her, fifteen of her co-workers stand in the same pose. The rear ones put their feet on the backs of the ones in front and all stare into my room. When I chase them away, they sneak away sadly and without barking to continue their incessant trotting. Food is plentiful. We live well, for we receive our pay in Lehi, and though there is nothing much to buy with it, at least we can always buy eggs. Gradually, almost all of our salary begins to be spent on buying eggs. Among the officers, Lieutenant Stala holds the first place in the consumption of eggs. He eats an enormous quantity of them. One day, when fuel shortages prevent us from flying, the test of this new source of energy begins immediately. The entire squadron down to the last man engages in physical exercise, usually cross-country running, gymnastics and, of course, soccer. I am still unable to participate in these exercises, as the soles of my feet are not quite through yet, and my shoulder hurts if I move my arm recklessly. But for the squadron as a whole, these athletic activities are a splendid recreation. Some, myself included, take the opportunity to walk in the mountain forests or practice other sports. We usually drive to the airfield between 4 and 5 am. At the far edge of town, we always come across a huge herd of sheep with a donkey walking ahead of them. His eyes are completely covered by a long, tangled man, and we wonder how he can see us at all. Because of that Monet, we nicknamed him Eclipse. One morning as we whiz by, we tug on the tip of his tail. First he kicks up his hooves like a kicking horse. Then, remembering his donkey nature, he freezes, and finally his chicken heart kicks in, and he takes off like the wind. We are flying sorties into a relatively stable sector, where, nevertheless, the constant arrival of reinforcements indicates that the Reds are preparing to strike into the heart of Romania. Our area of operation stretches from the village of Targu Frumos in the west to the bridgeheads on the Dniester and to Tiraspol in the southeast. We make most of our sorties to the area north of IRC. Here the Soviets are trying to dislodge us from the high ground around Karbati on the bank of the Prut. Fierce fighting in this sector is taking place around the ruins of Stansa Castle on the so-called Castle Hill. Time after time we lose this position, but we always regain it. In this zone, the Soviets are constantly bringing their huge reserves to bear. How often we have to attack bridges over the river. Our route takes us across the Prut to the Dniester beyond Kishinev and further east. We will remember these names for a long time. Kusika, Grigoriopol, the bridgehead at Buta. For a short time we stand on the same airfield with fighters from JG-52. They are commanded by Major Barkhorn, who knows his job from A to Z. They often accompany us on combat sorties, and we give them a lot of trouble because the new Yak-3, which has just appeared on the other side, every day puts on a new performance. The forward airbase of the group is in IRC, from here it is easier to patrol over the front line. The group commander is often on the front line to observe the interaction between the airplanes and ground troops. His forward post is equipped with a radio station that allows him to listen to all conversations in the air and on the ground. Fighter pilots talk to each other. Fighter pilots talk to the ground control officer. Stukars talk to each other and to the liaison officer on the ground. However, we usually all use different frequencies. A little anecdote that the 8th Group commander tells us on his last visit shows his concern for his sheep. He saw our squadron approaching Yassam. We are heading north. Our mission is to attack targets in the area of the castle that the army wanted to neutralize by establishing contact with our dispatcher. Over Yassis we are met not by our fighters, but by a strong La Formation. A second later the sky is filled with manoeuvring planes. The slow Stukas can't cope with the arrow-like Russian fighters, especially with a full load of bombs. The group commander watches the battle with mixed feelings and hears all the negotiations. The 7th Squadron commander, assuming that I didn't see the lay fives that were coming in from behind, shouts, Hannah Law, look behind you, one of them is going to shoot you down. I have long since spotted the fighter, but I still have plenty of time to make an evasive manoeuvre. 
I don't like this shouting over the radio telephone. It discourages the crews and adversely affects their marksmanship. So I reply, I haven't been born yet who will shoot me down. I'm not bragging. I only want to demonstrate a certain impartiality for the benefit of other pilots, because equanimity in a place like this is contagious. The Commodore concludes this story with a wide grin. When I heard that, I was no longer worried about you or the entire squadron. In fact, I watched this mess with great amazement. In instructing the crews, I gave them this lecture. Anyone who fails to stay close to me will be shot down by a fighter. Anyone who lags behind will be easy prey and will not be able to count on any help. So stay as close to me as possible. Getting hit by an anti-aircraft gun is most often a fluke. If you are unlucky, you are just as likely to be hit on the head by a slate blown off the roof or hit by a streetcar. Besides, war is not life insurance. The old-timers already know my point of view and winged sayings. When newcomers are brought up to speed, veterans hide a smile and say, he may be right about that. The fact that we take virtually no losses during encounters with enemy fighters supports my theory. The new recruits must, of course, undergo some training before they even get to the front, otherwise they will be a danger to their colleagues. Here, for example, just a few days later we make a sortie in the same area, and we are again attacked by large forces of enemy fighters. Lieutenant Drem, who has recently joined us, dies after the leader and cuts off his tail with his propeller. Fortunately, the wind carries their parachutes to our trenches. We descend in a spiral around them until they reach the ground, because Soviet fighters regularly open fire on our crews who parachute out. After a few months, Rem has developed into a first-class pilot, becoming a lead pilot himself and often filling in for the squad leader. I have a sense of sympathy for those who are slow learners. Lieutenant Schwerblatt is less fortunate. He has already made 700 combat missions and was awarded the Knight's Cross. After receiving a direct hit over the target, he had to make a forced landing just behind our trenches, lost his left leg and several fingers on his hand. We will be destined to fight together during the closing stages of the war. We have not a moment's respite, not only in the area north of Yars, but also in the east where the Russians have captured bridgeheads on the banks of the Dniester. One day, in the afternoon, three of our machines were flying over the Dniester bend between Kazitsa and Grigoriopol, where our defences have been broken through by a large number of T-34s. Lieutenant Fickle and a non-commissioned officer accompany me in a U-87 armed with bombs. An escort is supposed to be waiting for us, and as I approach the river bend, I can actually see low-flying fighters in the target area. Remaining optimistic, I conclude that they are their own. I am flying towards the target, looking for tanks, when I realize that these fighters are not my escort at all, but the Ivans. How stupid of us since we had already broken formation when we started looking for individual targets. The other two planes are delayed in their approach and slowly begin to join me. Moreover, our luck is changing. The Ivans are ready to fight, a desire they don't get very often. The non-commissioned officer's plane catches fire very quickly, and turning into a torch, disappears in a westerly direction. Fickle informs me that he too has been hit and has to get away. The pilot of the Lay-5, who in all probability knows his business, gets on my tail. The others keep a short distance behind him. No matter what I do, I don't manage to shake this lay off. He has partially released the flaps to reduce his speed. I fly into deep ravines to keep him low and make the danger of colliding with the ground confuse his aim. But he keeps behind me and his tracers pass quite close to my cockpit. My gunner Gaderman shouts excitedly that the fighter is sure to shoot us down. The gully widens to the southeast of the river bend and suddenly I'm making a turn with La clawing at my tail. Gaderman's machine gun jams. Tracers pass under the left wing. Gaderman yells. I reply, I can't, I've already got the handle in my stomach. The wonder begins to slowly build in me as to how this guy coming from behind can follow my turns in a fighter jet. Sweat is running down my forehead. I keep pulling on the control stick. The tracers continue to whiz by under my wing. Painting around, I can look directly into Ivan's tense focused face. 
the other lays have stopped their pursuit, apparently expecting that their colleague is about to shoot us down. Flying in this style is beyond them. Almost vertical turns at a height of 10-15 meters above the ground. Suddenly, on top of an earthen fortification, I noticed German soldiers. They are waving their hands like crazy, most likely unable to understand the situation. But here comes a loud cry from Gaiterman. Did Gaiterman shoot down the enemy plane with his machine gun? Or did the fighter spars fail to withstand the tremendous strain of those full-speed turns? In my headphones I can hear the loud shouts of the Russians. They saw what happened and it's out of the blue. I've lost Fickle and I'm flying home. Below me in the field lies a burning U-87. The non-commissioned officer and his flight gunner are standing next to it in full health, with German soldiers rushing to them. So tomorrow they will be able to fly again. Shortly after landing I meet with Fickle. There will be ample reason to celebrate our new birthday. Fickle and Gaderman also insist on celebrating. The next morning the ground adjuster of this sector calls and tells me how anxiously he watched yesterday's performance and heartily congratulates me on behalf of the division. It is clear from the radio message intercepted last night that the fighter pilot was a famous Soviet ace, twice hero of the Soviet Union. I must admit that he was a good pilot, which is no small thing. Shortly after this episode, I have to report to the Reich Marshal on two different occasions. The first time I land at Nuremberg and go to the castle of his ancestors. When I enter the courtyard, I am surprised to see Goering dressed up in medieval Germanic hunting costume and in the company of the attending physician, shooting a bow at a brightly colored target. He pays no attention to me until he has used up his entire supply of arrows. I'm surprised to see that he hasn't missed a single shot. I only hope he is not seized with the desire to show off his skill by making me compete with him, in which case he must realize that because of the wound in my shoulder, I cannot hold a bow, much less shoot. The fact that I report to him on my arrival in my undies in any case indicates my physical weakness. He tells me that he often exercises while on vacation, a way of keeping fit and his doctor willy-nilly, must join him in this enjoyable pastime. After a modest dinner with the family, at which only General Lorza is present among the other guests, I learn the reason for my summons. He awards me the pilot's gold medal with diamonds and asks me to form a squadron armed with the new Messerspitz. 410 with 50 ME guns and take command of it. He hopes that with this type of aircraft we will be able to match the four-engine aircraft used by the enemy. I conclude that since I have just been awarded diamonds, he wants to turn me into a fighter pilot. I'm sure he's thinking in terms of the categories of World War Y, during which pilots awarded Paul de Merit were usually fighter pilots like himself. He is predisposed to this branch of the Luftwaffe and those who belong to it, and would like to include me in that category. I tell him that I really wanted to become a fighter pilot earlier and what prevented it, but since those days I have gained valuable experience as a fighter pilot, and I would not want to change anything. I therefore ask him to drop the idea. He then tells me that he has the Führer's consent to this appointment, although he admits that he did not really like the idea of removing me from flying dive bombers. Nevertheless, the Führer agreed with him that I should in no case land behind Russian lines to rescue other crews anymore. That's an order. If crews are to be rescued, others must do so in the future. Such a requirement bothers me. Part of our code is the rule. All those shot down will be rescued. I believe I should be in charge of rescuing them myself because I, by virtue of my extensive experience, can do it more easily than anyone else. If it is to be done at all, then I am the person who should accomplish it. But to object now would be a waste of energy. At the critical moment, one must act as necessity dictates. Two days later, I return to Hosey and take part in the combat operations. Taking advantage of a pause of a few days, I decide to make a short trip to Berlin for a conference that kept getting postponed. On my return, I land at Gorlitz, visit home and fly east to Woslow, near Vienna. Early in the morning, when I wake up at my friend's house, I learn that people from the Rixmarshal's headquarters have been trying to find me all night. 
Having contacted him, I receive orders to proceed immediately to Birchtesgaden. Since I assume that this is another attempt to impose staff or some special duties on me, I ask him, is this good news or bad news? He knows me well and says, of course it's good. It is not without a sense of disbelief that I board the plane and fly a low altitude along the Danube. The weather is the worst imaginable. Clouds hang at a height of 50 metres. Almost all airfields are closed. The Vienna forests are hidden by thick clouds. I fly up the Danube Valley from St. Polten to Amstetten and Salzburg, where I land. Here they are already waiting for me and take me to the hunting lodge of the Reichsmarschall near the Berghof in Oberzelsberg. He is in a meeting with the Führer, and we are sitting at the table when he returns. His daughter Edda is quite a big girl. She is allowed to sit with us. After a short walk through the garden, the conversation takes on a formal character, and I can't wait to find out what's in the air this time. The house and garden are distinguished by genuinely good taste, nothing gaudy or posh. The family leads a simple, modest life. I receive a formal audience in a bright study with numerous windows, from which opens a majestic panorama of mountains glistening in the spring sunshine. Goering, no doubt, has a weakness for old customs and costumes. I just do not know how to describe his clothes. It is a kind of robe or toga such as worn by the ancient Romans, reddish-brown colour, fastened with a gold brooch. This is all new to me. He smokes a long floor-length pipe with a painted porcelain cup at the end. I remember that my father had one just like it when I was a kid. At the time his pipe was longer than mine. After watching mine in silence for a bit he begins to speak. I am summoned for a new award. He pins a front service gold medal with diamonds on my chest to commemorate my 2000 combat sorties. It's a brand new medal that no one has ever been awarded before because I alone have made that many sorties. It's made of solid gold, and in the centre is a platinum wreath with crossed swords, underneath which is the number 2000, set with tiny diamonds. I'm glad this award doesn't come with any nasty extras like it used to. We then discuss the situation, and he opines that I should lose no time and return to base. I intend to do so anyway. He tells me that a large-scale offensive is being prepared in my sector, and the signal to launch it will be given within a few days. He has just returned from a meeting with the Führer, where the whole situation was discussed to the smallest detail. He expresses surprise that I did not notice these preparations on the spot, since approximately 300 tanks will be involved in this operation. I am now straining my hearing. The number 300 amazes me. It is fine for the Russian side, but so many tanks on our side? I reply that I can hardly believe it. I ask him if he could name these divisions and the number of tanks they have at their disposal, because I am perfectly well informed about most of the divisions in my sector and how many serviceable tanks there are in each of them. On the eve of my departure from the front, I had a conversation with General Unrein, commander of the 14th Armoured Division. It was two weeks ago, and he complained to me bitterly that he had only one tank left for the whole division, and even this vehicle could not be considered combat ready, because he had ordered it to be equipped for ground control of air flights. This machine was of much greater value to him than a combat ready tank, because having a good connection with the Stukas he could neutralize with the many targets which his tanks alone could not disable. I thus know absolutely exactly how many tanks are in the 14 armored division. The Reichsmarschall finds it difficult to believe me, as he has an entirely different figure. He says to me, half seriously, half joking, If I did not know you, I would put you under arrest for such words. But we're about to find out. He goes to the telephone and gets through to the chief of the general staff. You have just informed the Führer that 300 tanks are earmarked for Operation X. I, standing next to him, can hear every word. Yes, that is correct. I want to know the names of these divisions and how many tanks they have. I have one person here who is well acquainted with the situation. Who is it? asks the chief of the general staff. This is one of my men and he should know. The chief of the general staff, unfortunately for him, started precisely with the 14th Armoured Division. He says that the division has 60 tanks. Goering can barely contain himself. 
My man says that the 14th has only one tank. There is a long silence on the other end of the line. When did he leave the front? Four days ago. Silence again. And then... Forty tanks are in transit. The rest are in repair shops, but will certainly be in their units by the right date. So this figure is correct. He gives the same answer for all divisions. The Rix Marshal hangs up the phone with rage. This is how things are done. The Fuhrer is given a completely false picture that is based on incorrect data and is still surprised when the operation does not bring the success that was hoped for. Today, thanks to you, this case has been explained. But how often we have built our hopes on such utopias. The entire communications network in the southeastern zone is constantly bombed by the enemy. Who knows how many tanks out of these 40, for example, could even reach the front, and when exactly that will happen. Who knows whether the repair shops will be able to get spare parts in time, and if they get them, will they finish the repairs in the allotted time? I must report everything to the Fuhrer immediately. He speaks with anger, then silence is established. When I return to the front, I am still mulling over what I have just heard. What is the purpose of this misleading and false reports? Is it done by accident or on purpose? Either way it plays into the hands of the enemy. Who and in what circles commits these sordid acts? Et -e. I interrupt my journey by stopping in Belgrade, and as I come in for a landing at Semlinsky Airfield, a formation of American four-engine bombers appears overhead. As I step off the runway, I see all the airfield personnel scattering in different directions. To the west of the runway are hills in which underground tunnels have been dug to serve as shelters. I can see the formation exactly in front of me, a short distance from the airfield. It all doesn't look good. I run after the human descendant with as much speed as I can develop in my ounce. I just manage to skid into the tunnel as a series of bombs explode on the airfield, raising a giant mushroom cloud of smoke. I can't believe how anything is able to survive. After a few minutes, the smoke clears a bit and I make my way back to the airfield. Almost everything is destroyed. My trusty U-87 stands among the wreckage, riddled with shrapnel, but the engine is intact and the landing gear is in good order. Most of the controls are functioning normally. I look for a strip of land away from the runway that would be suitable for takeoff, and am glad to be airborne again. Dedicated and brave, my wounded machine carries me over the entire southeast zone and brings me down to the ground at Husi. During my absence, a Romanian U-87 formation has been attached to us. The crews consist mostly of officers, some of whom have some experience, but we soon discover that it is much better if they fly with us in the same formation. Otherwise, the number of their losses on each sortie remains at an all-time high. Especially they are pestered by enemy fighters, and it takes them very little time to realize, on the basis of their experience, that even in a low-speed plane does not have to be shot down if you manage to hold formation. The regimental staff move to the FE-190. Our first squadron is withdrawn from combat for eight weeks for rest and is based at the airfield at Sochi region. Here the experienced pilots of U-87s are being retrained on single-seat airplanes. In the long run, all our units will have to do the same, since production of the U-87 will soon be discontinued. While we are stationed at Husey, in between flights I am practicing on HQ few 1990s in order not to interrupt combat operations later. I finish my self-training with one or two combat sorties and feel quite safe in this airplane. It is July and our sorties are becoming more frequent as the planned offensive north of ESC has begun. It is not being conducted with a fictitious number of tanks and later than prescribed by the original plan, but nevertheless with fresher and more combat-ready units than usual. It is necessary to capture the high ground between the Prut and Targul Frumos. It is easier to hold and the capture of this section would deprive the enemy of a convenient springboard for attack. The whole front line in this sector is in motion, and we succeed in pushing the Soviets back a considerable distance. Resisting stubbornly, they manage to hold several key points. They are lucky because the local attacks with which we had hoped to wipe out these pockets of resistance never materialized. 
some of our attacking units which are thrown into action like fire departments where the fiercest fighting is going on have to be withdrawn. In the course of this offensive I make my 2100th combat sortie. The target is a familiar one. The bridge at Skalini, which is important for supplying the Soviet units under attack every time we go in to attack it from Jars. It is already shrouded in an artificial smoke screen and we can never be sure we are not dropping bombs on our own troops. Every time I see that veil, I laugh, imagining the faces of the Ivans down there, gazing intently into the smoke, waiting for our approach. It doesn't take a linguist to hear one repeated word. Stuka, 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 stuka. Our days in Tusi are numbered.